name's Chuck Cassidy, and I am joined tonight by an outstanding team uh, who I will introduce um, for our penultimate hand therapy essentials session uh, brought to you by AO North America. And this session is on the elbow. Our faculty tonight include uh, my partner in crime, Alex St. Clair from Tufts Medical Center, uh, Rebecca Naduski uh, from Elon, Jeff Lawton from Michigan, Peter Ree and Keely Elwood uh, from the Mayo Clinic, and John Capo from Rutgers. Uh, the disclosures are as listed and have been reconciled. A link to the re recording will be sent out through Zoom 24 hours after uh, the conclusion of this webinar tonight. Um, we have to thank uh, uh, Chai Mudgal and uh, Becky Nadusky, uh, the brainchild children of uh, the Hand Therapy Essentials series, which started back uh, on April 29th, starting at the fingertips and has migrated up the arm. Uh, and we'll conclude next week uh, with uh, a rousing international roundtable uh, run by Kieran uh, from uh, the MGH and uh, Becky Nadusky. Uh, with an international faculty on both the uh, uh, surgeon and therapist side. So please uh, be sure to stay tuned and uh, put that on your calendars. And remember, uh, uh, Zoom etiquette, please keep your uh, microphones muted. Well, yours have been muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and use the Q&A uh, for questions related to uh, topic uh, discussions and uh, uh, we'll be happy to either respond uh, uh, in, uh, by typing or uh, we may bring them up during the session. So not in the chat box, in the Q&A. Uh, so the learning objectives are as listed to highlight the importance of communication between the hand surgeon and the therapist in managing complex elbow problems. Describe safe ways to rehab potentially unstable elbows. Explain the utility of various types of splints in man managing elbow contractures and recognize red flags that can derail recovery following elbow surgery. So we're going to start from the beginning, of course, uh, with an intro. In the intro, we'll discuss functional anatomy and challenges specific to elbow rehab, red flags, and the, uh, highlight the importance of communication between the surgeon and the therapist. So I'm going to give you seven take home points. Number one, uh, the MCL, it's sexy, but is it important? Yes and no. The MCL is the principal restraint to valgus. So that's valgus stress right there. And you can see that elbow is somewhat unstable. The secondary restraint is the radial head. So if the radial head is intact, the elbow will still be relatively stable. So the MCL does not always have to be repaired or reconstructed. Uh, when is it really important? When the radial head is absent, of course, you lost the secondary stabilizer. In some complex injury patterns that we'll discuss, uh, if there's an associated flexor pronator rupture, and uh, Pete Ree is going to uh, talk a little bit about that. And then the throwing athlete, of course, is where the Tommy John operation uh, got its name. Uh, interestingly, though, that's the anterior bundle, but the posterior bundle is one that's the bane of our rehab, and that is taut in flexion. And so that's the one that gets tight and limits flexion in rehab and needs to be addressed sometimes surgically in treating uh, elbow loss of motion. Number two, we live our lives in varus. As you can see here, this gentleman holding the weight weights. Um, straight varus instability is pretty rare. You can see it here in this patient. The primary restraint to varus is actually the art articular surfaces. So the medial edge of the uh, coronoid and the medial uh, crista of the trochlea, as you see there. The secondary restraint is the ligament itself. It becomes critically important, however, with injuries such as this, which is a various post-remedial injury. And you can see that that support on the medial side of the coronoid has been lost and that elbow is going to be uh, really unstable. And that's something you need to discuss uh, with, uh, with your therapist in terms of how best to rehab that type of injury, which usually requires surgery. So the lateral ligament complex is a, is a complex structure that includes the lateral collateral ligament that we discussed. It in and of itself is not incredibly important, but the 
Lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the primary stabilizer to posterolateral rotatory instability. It acts as a sling to help to support the uh, uh, lateral side. And that structure is virtually always injured in a terrible triad. And uh, here's the term, the bald epicondyle. You can see here, the hand is to the right and there's nothing attached to the lateral epicondyle. It's been avulsed. Uh, the concept of PLR is a little bit confusing and it's, it may look like a radial head dislocation, but it's not. So the radius and ulna move together. And the best way I've thought of it is to look at the elbow from behind with the elbow flexed at 90 degrees. So the, the ulna is the, is the uh, trapezoid in blue. Uh, the radial head is an orange, and then this, the sling is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And so with posterolateral instability, the forearm sort of hypersupinates and drops out, and the radial head slides out from under the capitellum. And here's a radiographic example in fluoroscopy. You can see the radial head sliding out with the posterior uh, drawer maneuver. Uh, and here's an intraoperative one. This patient's really unstable. You can see uh, depigmentation from multiple steroid injections. So that's a combination of what's called a posterior drawer, popping the radial head out, a dimple sign where you can see there the hollow that's left from where the radial head should be, and then the pivot shift like that. That's a pretty unstable elbow. And so in the, pec in the spectrum of instability, you can see from left to right, the radial head sort of slides out from underneath the capitellum and then the elbow dislocates fully. And you can see that the radial head in the, in the coronoid uh, resists shear and they can be injured if that it happens dramatically. So three and four, Physics 101, the maximum capacity of the elbow joint is at 80 degrees. So when the elbow is flexed beyond 80 or extended beyond 80, that increases the pressure in the joint and causes discomfort. So that's the reason why patients who have elbow injuries tend to hold their elbow flex. And that's also why it's so hard to rehab these elbows because in full flexion or full extension, the pressure is much higher in the elbow joint. Uh, number two is that uh, physics, with the lever arm of your forearm, if you have a five pound weight in your hand, about three times your body weight goes across your elbow and it, it's heading in that direction, as you can see, posteriorly putting a lot of stress on the anterior radial head and the coronoid. And so the coronoid again is a restraint to shear. Interestingly, when you have these fractures, coronoid fracture almost always goes across into the radial head just like that. It's like you lost that shear uh, uh, protection through the coronoid and the radial head. And what you see is something like this, the coronoid fraction, the anterior head of the radial head, uh, anterior half of the radial head are gone. The radial head itself is not, uh, it's not round. It's actually elliptical and it is tilted a little bit, uh, which, it make, which makes it tough to repair anatomically. And so uh, because of that, if it's off a little bit, it produces a cam effect. So this is a radial head implant in a disarticulated specimen looking uh, down the forearm and you can see in neutral, the radial head sits well. In pronation up above, it still sits pretty well. But in supination, it actually rotates down and out. And here's a close-up view. And that's one of the reasons why people with radial head replacements have trouble getting supination back. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the mechanics of the, uh, these types of radial head implants. And that's why we tend to undersize the diameter a little bit to make up for that. Number five, don't forget the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve is in close proximity to, uh, to the elbow joint. In fact, uh, the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament is the floor of the cubital tunnel. So it's right there, susceptible to injury and also susceptible to scarring. Speaking of that, there's this condition called down, which is delayed onset ulnar neuritis, uh, which can derail your rehab. It's atypical loss of motion, usually inflection starting at about a week or as early as a week post injury or surgery. Patients report pain in the cubital tunnel area, they may not necessarily report numbness and tingling in the uh, ring and small fingers. It may compromise the outcome. And uh, if you're a therapist and you pick that up, definitely uh, uh, communicate that to uh, the treating uh, surgeon because uh, that may need to be addressed surgically quickly. Uh, then this number six, heterotopic ossification. For some reason, elbows are prone to develop HO after injury. Uh, it's important to worry when a patient seems to look good right after the surgery, but seven to 14 days afterwards, they have their elbow looks a little more swollen, it's warmer, they have uh, lost some of that motion that they had gained. Uh, here's an example of a patient I treated uh, arthroscopically. Um, here, that's the, you can see all the, the stuff in the front of the elbow and the back of the elbow, did a great job, was doing well for a little while, and you can see a cloud of bone developing and that unfortunately progressed to this um, and uh, derailed his, uh, his rehab and ultimately had to have this uh, HO resected. And then number seven, 
patient expectations. Patients want to have a normal elbow, and that may not necessarily be realistic. Uh, we know that functional range of motion is about 30 to 130, and 50 of pronation and 50 of supination. I say don't limit their goals by any means, uh, but uh, they have to have some sort of um, reality check once in a while. And then patient factors affecting outcome. Post-op anticoagulation can uh, cause hematoma, and that can definitely mess up the, the surgery, uh, burn or head injury. Uh, males, obesity, opioid use can definitely impact your ability to participate in rehab, pain tolerance, and the worse the fracture, uh, obviously, uh, potentially the worse the outcome. Uh, and so th uh, surgeon therapist communication is essential. Are we on the same page? Uh, so with that in mind, I turn it over to my partner, Alex. All right, thank you, Dr. Cassidy. I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, so I just quickly wanna go over uh, the elbow from the therapist perspective. Um, and I think even for some of the most experienced therapists, uh, the elbow can be quite a challenging and sometimes frustrating uh, joint to rehab, uh, mainly because it's so prone to stiffness. Um, it's a joint that has this high contact uh, articular congruency, uh, and so it's just anatomically predisposed um, to become stiff. So even when you have uh, a small trauma, you can uh, get loss of motion. Um, and then when we have more complex injuries uh, where there's a concern for instability, the elbow is often going to be immobilized, typically in some degree of flexion, rotation may be uh, restricted, uh, which is then going to contribute to uh, stiffness later down the line um, when they're rehabbing with us. So the challenge for us as therapists is finding this balance of present, uh, preventing stiffness uh, with early motion, preserving stability, uh, and protecting healing structures. So a, a bit of a feat for us. Um, and as Dr. Cassie's I uh, already highlighted, um, it is really important that um, just from the minute these patients walk into our clinic that we are have established good communication with the surgeon. Uh, we don't just want to rely solely on the referral diagnosis. Um, in order to safely treat these patients, especially these more complex injuries, uh, we want to make sure that we uh, have all the information we need so that we can safely rehab them. Um, so whether that's walking down the hall or picking up your phone um, and calling their office, uh, really make sure that you have all the information that you need. And then as these, ther or as these patients are progressing through therapy, um, making sure that you're continuing to uh, have this active dialogue with the surgeon. Um, one thing that I do, uh, particularly with patients that are coming from uh, outside hospitals is anytime that they're going to have a follow-up appointment with their physician, I send a progress note and any questions that I have as far as um, being able to progress this patient. Um, we want to make sure that the therapy is effective as possible, um, but also make sure that we're doing it in a safe way. Uh, and then therapists, we just want to think about what are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. So thinking about what stage of wound healing this patient is in, um, what are structures that we need to protect, particularly uh, if there's a ligament injury that we need to take into consideration, um, making sure that we're addressing uh, adjacent joints to prevent stiffness. Um, and then we also wanna think about factors that may impact participation in therapy. Um, so things like social factors, uh, insurance coverage, uh, what's the patient's health literacy, um, for me in particular, um, I have a very high um, or large population of non-English speaking patients. Um, and so language barrier is definitely something that I have to consider. Um, and then uh, thinking about uh, certain comorbidities that may affect healing. Um, and then we also wanna think about, or what, what is the education that we need to provide this patient? So maybe beyond just giving them an HEP, um, we might need to consider uh, educating them on certain activity modifications, uh, particularly if they have uh, 
precautions that we need to maintain uh, so that they're still able to function in their daily life. Um, and so for assessment, I think uh, Becky has said this really well uh, in past sessions and that we as therapists are data collectors. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're getting a really thorough occupational profile, um, getting their social history, what is their lifestyle and their functional demands. Um, we want to make sure that we're uh, uh, assessing bilateral range of motion, um, individuals' norms can vary. Uh, so we don't wanna just stick to what uh, the typical normal limits are. Um, some patients have hyperextension in their elbows. Um, a uh, individual with you know, a big muscular bicep is uh, potentially gonna have less function than someone like me with little spaghetti arms. Um, so using the unaffected side to determine the norms and kind of what you're working towards. Um, and then we really just wanna educate these patients. So uh, to reiterate with Dr. Casti, we wanna make sure we're um, setting realistic expectations. Um, and that, again, communicating with the surgeon and making sure that the messages we're giving the patient is analogous with what we're the surgeon is telling them. Um, it's also really, really important uh, with these patients that we reinforce um, their influence uh, in their therapeutic outcomes. I think a lot of times uh, people come to therapy and they think, oh, the therapist is going to fix me and then I get to go home and everything's will get better, um, but uh, we as therapists are uh, here to facilitate their progress, um, but they really have to play an active role. Um, and then lastly, uh, wanna make sure that we're using the teach back method to optimize carryover, especially considering certain social factors. And so takeaway points, um, again, effective communication between surgeon and therapist is super important. Um, with rehabbing elbows, we need to balance goals of mobility and stability while not uh, compromising for one versus the other, uh, making sure we're considering patient factors when establishing plan of care uh, and making it a collaborative effort between the surgeon, therapist, and patient. Um, and so on that note, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and then pass it on to Dr. Capo to uh, discuss our first case. While Dr. Capo is pulling up his slides, I just want to remind all of our participants that we welcome your questions in the Q&A box. So please don't hesitate, especially as we get into the case discussions, to put any questions that you have in the Q&A for us to answer either online or via discussion. OK. I'll start from the beginning. Hello, everybody. The vexing elbow. <clears throat> Am I good? Can you see me? Not yet. We don't see your slides, though. Oh. We see you. You look great, but we don't yeah. see your slides yet. But that's not enough, right? Yeah. Share screen. How's that? Nope. Oh. Good? There we go. Sorry. Okay. The elbow <clears throat> elbows is critical, right? So the, you know, the way I look at it is... Uh, the hinge joint, the humeralar joint is, is the important joint. And then, you know, the radio capitellar joint is somewhat accessory, but still important. And then there's the PRUJ that we can't forget about. But the humeralar joint is the hinge, which is really critical. All right. So the Montasia fractures are a different animal than an electron fracture. It's a proximal ulna fracture with something going on with the radial head. So it's a complex proximal ulna. And then if it includes the coronoid, it's even more difficult. And the, uh, the radial head is subluxating anteriorly or posteriorly. So these are bad actors. So this is a, a bad x-ray, but it's a Montasia variant, a proximal ulna comminuted, something going on in the radial head here with subluxation. So this is uh, the approach, a posterior approach. I just wanted to show you, you can see from the ulna and the, you know, the ulna and the radial head from the lateral side. And here's the radial head comminuted. And then the important LCL is repaired through suture anchors and pulled down. So this is the post-operative x-ray. This is an older case. And my plate could be a little bit more uh, contoured to the ulna. Uh, 
you know, I might put some more screws up into the coronoid, but the joint appears to be stable and reduced some, some uh, screws in the radial head and suture anchors in the LCL. So we're looking for reduction and uh, stability. Okay, so going on to the radial head fractures, you know, because I only have five, five minutes or so, uh, and the, we could talk forever about coronoid fractures, but we're not. So radial head fractures are, are, are vexing and difficult. Common to radial head fractures, and, and they look subtle, but you see these fragments posterior and anterior, and they're difficult to fix. So this is a case of mine, 57 year old, fell from a ladder, um, closed injury, and he's got the, the Montasia variant with a, a proximal ulna with a coronoid fracture, and the radial head is is something's going on with it and it's, it's a little bit lateral. So how do we address this? So we have to address the, the coronoid and the proximal hole into the shaft and the radial head was unreconstructable. So we put a radial head arthroplasty in there and reduced it. Uh, reduction is good. And this is the, the, uh, the trial I'll use as a spacer to get my length and then bring it down and you see my plate is a little bit better contoured now. And we even made it more contoured with the in situ bender, but we want that humeral ulnar joint to be aligned. That's the most important thing. So radial head, uh, this is a spherical radial head. It's well aligned. The humeral joint looks good. It's, you know, I still worry a little bit about posterior subluxation, but there's some comminution centrally, but I think uh, we have a, a, a large plate on there that's stable uh, and uh, good reduction. So radial head fractures, why are they so difficult? Because the radial head's not round. You know, it's got angulation on the shaft. The radial head is not perpendicular to the shaft. It's about 15 degrees. There's cancellous bone in the radial head. You can't get bicortical purchase. Um, and uh, you need to be in the safe zone. So you're, if you're up here on the radial head, the plate can be prominent. And the, the PRUJ is flat and the lateral surface is more contoured. So this is another case of fracture dislocation, radial head um, fracture, and the uh, humeral ulnar joint is dislocated. We reduce it, and this is common. And I'll go back, she's 32. So, you know, this is a hard one to fix, but she's 32. Uh, she doesn't want, you know, she wants her normal joint, she says. So I try as much as I can to, to fix these. So treatment options are, are closed treatment. No, ORF the radial head um, or, or ORF the radial head. Sure, let's try to do it. Metal radial head, maybe. Silicone, no. So any silicone radial heads don't work. So this is, you know, the common due to fracture. There's three fragments and, and I would still try to fix this in a young patient. So three fragments. Um, and you know, just because it's on the back table doesn't mean it's going to die. It's not like a femoral head. We put it together in a reasonable alignment. You can see because of the angulation of the radial head, the plate doesn't go 90 degrees. I've got some separate screws in the head and her humeral ulnar joint appears to be well aligned. Then we try to get that plate in the safe zone and Bob Hotch has talked about it. And it's really the, the lateral side or the radial side with the arm in neutral. So plus or minus 90, degrees or 110 degrees, and that's where it wants to be. And even if it's there, and I'll go back, you know, that, radial head, that radial head plate can be prominent and bothersome. So um, uh, if I put this plate and I tell the patients that, you know, you're probably gonna want this plate out and half of them do, and we can do a release. So in the safe zone is important. And also, you know, respect that collateral ligament. So different approaches. This is a coker approach, which is the old approach, which I don't use often because the LCL is kind of in the front. So this is like, this worries me that the LCL is, is compromised. So I prefer a Kaplan or a column approach where the LCL is behind us and I can see the radial head and the anterior joint. So this is a case of mine, you know, surgical technique. If I go lateral to look at the radial head, I want to stay above the equator of the capitellum and above the equator of the radial head. If the radial head's broken, you look for the capitellum and you can see the extensor mass and then the uh, supinator muscles are oblique. Supinator muscles are oblique. If I see the capitellum, I stay anterior to it. And my LCL is here. So when I pull on this, I don't want to pull too hard. And the posterior osseous nerve is down here a little bit. I had a slide, but I took that out. So if you go more than uh, two centimeters down the radial head neck, I look for the uh, posterior osseous nerve. So if we can't fix some radial head arthroplasty, what are the concepts? Um, the concepts are, uh, if you cannot replace it, or if you cannot fix it, you should probably replace it for stability because there's associated bony and ligamentous instability and elbow subluxation. So there's a lot of different radial heads out there, but what do we know? We know that um, we need a metal radial head, a rigid radial head. We want it to be modular where there's a stem and a head. And it's, it appears that chrome cobalt's a good joint bearing surface. 
And you know, the best ones seem to wobble in the, in the, the neck and kind of self-align. And when we size it, we don't want it to do too big. As Chuck said, you know, don't overstuff it. I look at the height of the coronoid to match it. And then I look at the medial humeral ulnar joint line to, um, uh, to line that up to make sure the radial head is properly aligned. So this is another case, 67 year old female, low energy injury and common to radial head fracture, small fragments, couldn't fix that. You can see she's in a little valgus um, and replaced it and replaced it. And I think there's a, a suture anchor in the coronoid as well for anterior capsule suture anchor on the LCL. And it looks good, you know, it looks good lined up, uh, but this is her at five years. And this is kind of how they look a lot, you know, that the radial heads, you know, bouncing around in there, but she's asymptomatic, she has good motion and she's happy. So if you replace the radial head, I tend to leave it in and don't take it out because you never know if there's other instabilities, but there's little osteophytes in HO. So in conclusion, the radial head is an important structure, complex elbow fracture dislocations, RAF or arthroplasty is indicated in these combined uh, uh, cases, these um, comminuted cases. Excision is very rare, you know, and um, it's only if it's a chronic arthritic elbow that maybe we do, or a rheumatoid that we do an excision. So that's what I have. Thank you. Thanks, John. That was a whirlwind. You have, you're an encyclopedia of knowledge about elbows. Um, and I'm yeah. sorry, I had to limit it a little bit just for the sake of time. But uh, so in terms of uh, the first one, uh, that Montasia, how does that patient leave the operating room? What type of immobilization? When do you start moving the patient? And what specific instructions do you give your therapist? Yeah, I, I always put them in an elbow splint, a you know, posterior elbow splint. And I put them in, in 90, you know, I, I, I flex them up not too much, 80 degrees, 90 degrees. And then I look at it, if it's the LCL that I repaired, I wanna keep them out of supination. So I'll splint them in about 45 degrees of pronation. And then when we do therapy, I'll, I'll still, you know, you know, that one was pretty stable, but I'll still avoid terminal extension for a while and let them maybe, you know, I'll test them in the OR and let them extend to whatever is stable, it might be 25, 30 degrees and flexion is good. Flexion reduces the elbow. Uh, and then I'll do that flexion extension in pronation because it'll unload the LCL. And then 90 degrees of flexion, uh, do some rotation with supination, um, supination uh, and pronation. But if I have an LCL injury, I don't want, I don't want to su supinate them fully. So I'll supinate them maybe, maybe 30, 45 degrees and allow them to pronate because that'll tighten up the LCL. So that's what I do. Uh, and some surgeons are fans are of hinged braces and some are not. Are you a hinged brace guy? I, I don't think it does much, you know, because I think it helps me more than them because I don't know if it's lined up, you know, well, um, you know, maybe at a month out if they, if I want to protect them a little bit, I will, but I, I, I don't think it concentrically aligns often. And one, one final question. If you uh, repair the radial head on the back table and put it back in, do you treat that patient differently than if you were to just do a, a radial head replacement? A little bit. You know, I might, you know, slow them down a little bit, but I want to move them. You know, not much, not much. Because if, if I fix it and it's unstable, I'll, I'll throw it away and, and replace it. So um, I want them to move. I don't want them to get stiff, but you can do, again, short arc, you do rotation and do some short arc flexion extension. So um, yeah, if it's very comminuted and osteopenic, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off a little bit. All right, and Keely's got the therapist perspective. Keely. Hello, everybody. Just pulling up the slideshow here. Um, so we're looking at the posterior montasia fracture repair. So again, what Dr. Capo had mentioned and what Alex had mentioned at the beginning, really critical to think about the key structures that are involved in repaired in surgery. That stable joint of motion or stable range of motion and ensuring that we're maintaining that as well as keeping, um, keeping the joint stable and keeping the range of motion within functional planes. So looking at the stability of both the proximal radial ulnar joint and the distal radial ulnar joint, um, sometimes we'll see these patients with their post-op still in place. So looking even distally, if they have swelling, if the wrist is not included, trying to manage some of that kind of even before that post-op comes down. Um, and Alex touched upon kind of all of these um, topics as far as looking at evaluation. I think one thing I like to provide some education on is thinking about um, skin hygiene, skin breakdown on um, kind of axillary hygiene, making sure that they're not having any guarding postures, making sure they're moving fingers and shoulders as soon as possible. 
Um, the next slide here has just some functional range of motion. So thinking about getting clients and patients back to function as quickly as possible, but thinking about the range of motion that we will need to obtain this. So this is a systematic review that I found that looked at degrees of elbow flexion and extension required in functional tasks that I thought was kind of a nice, re nice reference, but also thinking as we're talking to patients, looking at their goals and kind of their top priorities to return to functional activity. Um, typically, we like to see these patients five to seven days post-op. Um, sometimes we remove the post-op, sometimes they will be removed by the surgeon prior to the session. Um, big proponent, especially looking at the elbow, is edema control and pain management. So um, edema control, you can think about using like a spanda grip or a tube grip sleeve, but often if patients are quite painful, um, I'll start with like an Artiflex wrap with an ACE overlay just to provide them some, some support because pulling on that sleeve through the elbow um, can be quite painful um, initially. So kind of thinking about that approach versus um, you could also look at using some Coban too, um, but ACE wrap is typically my go-to to start with because it's pretty gentle and can provide some of that compression. Um, it's all surgeon preference as far as when we look at patients fitting them with a hinged elbow brace or a custom component, but also looking at the patient's body habitus, the arm shape. Um, sometimes we've gotten clients that just don't fit into the prefabricated braces, so we'll have to um, fabricate a custom orthosis for them. Um, starting range of motion, looking at that limited supination and pronation, um, kind of beginning to kind of do that in a safe range, but avoiding those kind of um, full ranges of motion. And then looking at kind of towards the mid range of rehab, looking for active assisted range of motion. So incorporating the Contralateral side, maybe using a bar or a cane to kind of work on some gentle assisted motion. And a lot of times with the clients, I like to really encourage them to really think about holding the, the, the motion, especially when it's in a limited plane for a prolonged period of time. So holding for a few seconds, really letting those tissues um, kind of warm up and um, kind of um, adapt to some of that stress as we're beginning to increase the motion. And if motion is not progressing, once the elbow is deemed stable, typically for us, it's anywhere from a six to eight week follow up with the surgeon. Once we get that green light, then we may start looking at some static progressive orthoses. So looking at something that is custom order fit for the patient or um, kind of on the right hand side of my slide is a custom fabricated option that I've done before. It's a, it's a posterior elbow, but the trough through the forearm is widened quite a bit to be able to allow for a wrist support underneath to kind of give a little bit more pull using Velcro for that rotation. So I think some considerations, especially with this type of fracture and the hardware that's used, um, being mindful of that olecranon. Um, if the hardware is still in place, it can be sometimes painful or tender for patients as they're resting their arm on the table. The picture that I've included is um, an elbow pad, but you can make that with like a spander grip and some, some foam padding used for splinting. Um, you could use like an ace bandage or even a rolled washcloth, depending on, on the... Um, on the patients and demands that they have. Always being mindful of ulnar nerve symptoms, um, really managing that edema right away, making sure that they're not having any intrinsic hand weakness, always keeping an eye on that. Um, and then really emphasizing and looking, if you have the opportunity to see the operative report, what structures were repaired, um, being mindful of any sort of contracture or heterotrophic ossification. So really being mindful and taking very thorough measurements to make sure that you're able to see progress with your patients. Um, if we have some time, I'm not sure if we have time, Becky, here with this section. I don't know if there's any questions right now that we can address. We don't have any questions right now, Keely. Okay, then I will pass it off to Dr. Ree. I have a question, Keely. Yes. Um, can we talk about the psychology of uh, dealing with patients, especially anxious patients, mm -hmm. about uh, what's the, how do you distinguish good pain from bad pain? Um, well, and especially with the elbow, I found that the patients that I've worked with are, are really quite painful. And so I like to kind of my phrase is really, you know, when you're having 
doing the exercises, some discomfort is expected, like tightness, like you're stretching a hamstring or kind of some muscle tightness, like you're um, trying to lift a heavy weight, but really within five to 10 minutes after terminating the exercise, that pain should really be subsiding. And so setting that expectation that we will kind of keep an eye on things. You know, you can add, sometimes I'll add heat or ice at the end of the session, especially if the patient is demonstrating like guarding behaviors, um, maybe if they're emotional during the session, really trying to make them as comfortable as possible because um, if patients are guarding, you know, the goal is to really start getting them moving safely. Um, and so trying to address that with them, making them comfortable, maybe having them lay on a, on a plinth or a bed, supporting with some pillows and towels, um, maybe putting them in a private room versus an open clinic, um, just really trying to figure out the best way to support them and even asking them that um, would be kind of the approach that I would take. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think I feel more comfortable with our therapists, I think primarily because they're right down the hall, they're great, mm -hmm. but they'll also feel more comfortable with pushing a little bit harder. You know, I, I have some trepidation about sending patients to therapists that I, I, don't, I don't know, and they tend to be very cautious, uh, which can compromise the outcome. Obviously, it's a, it's a balance between the therapist and the patient, but this really highlights the importance of confidence in each other and communication between the therapist and the surgeon. Thanks. All right, uh, I'll share some perspectives on terrible triad injuries. Not that these are great injuries to have, but it is an awesome uh, illustration of uh, the complex anatomy at the elbow. So I think you have to master that if you wanna treat these and rehab these. So here's a case presentation of a patient who uh, fell from a pretty high uh, height, uh, had this close injury, everything's intact. He has this um, injury pattern here shown. And then here's his post-reduction radiographs. And now you can uh, see that there is a radial head fracture. There is a coronoid fracture, not quite sure how big that is. Uh, and just the fact that there was a large instability event, um, you know that there's probably some element uh, of soft tissue injury as well. So this constellation of injuries uh, is what defines the terrible triad injury, which is the ulnar humeral dislocation, the rail head slash neck fracture, and the coronoid fracture. I think it's, it's good to know uh, the mechanism of these injuries, because I think that these are all in a continuum uh, of, of the propagation of energy that results in different types of structures that are injured. And probably most importantly is, other than knowing the anatomy, but knowing what the contributions of these anatomic uh, structures are to the primary. So in this classic uh, uh, figure of the primary stabilizers, the ulnar humeral joint anterior uh, band in the MCL and the LUCL, and then the secondary stabilizers, realizing that if a primary stabilizer is not uh, competent, then uh, secondary stabilizers become more important. So uh, terrible triad injuries I've explained here, but then if you expand that, the radial head and neck fractures, like Dr. Cassidy explained, uh, almost uh, not always, I guess, but uh, a lot of times involve the LUCL. And the coronoid fracture is part of the only humeral constraint, uh, but also the anterior band and the MCL. So really two uh, stabilizing primary structures there. Uh, this was just a video of a pivot shift that uh, Dr. Cassidy showed. I was just thinking, man, when I lived in Texas, I was really tan there. <laughs> Living in Minnesota, it's a, we're a little, little um, less tan. Anyhow, um, so these are the preoperative CT scans, and you can see here there's a radial head fracture. Here's the axial of the uh, intermedial coronoid, uh, the coronal of the coronoid, and then there's a uh, sagittal of the coronoid too. So my surgical plan here was to reconstruct, uh, to do a radial head arthroplasty, because uh, I did not think I could reconstruct that. It was too comminuted repair the LUCL as well, and then uh, fix the coronoid. Uh, so I think I've established or restored the stability to these uh, primary stabilizers. Now, if the patient still has some instability uh, at the only humeral joint, and typically we'd see that with a SAG sign on a true um, lateral, then I will uh, usually, if I can stabilize them in form pronation and get, um, get, uh, uh, get, usually that will stabilize the um, only humeral joint, the radio capitellar joint. Uh, I will do that and keep them in 90 degrees. It's pretty rare that I put a patient into dynamic external fixation. Uh, usually I can get them maintained with, a, with form pronation or 
if I need to, a static external fixator for just a couple of weeks. And as we know, the elbow gets pretty stiff. And as long as we can keep it reduced, um, I think it's a necessary evil. So for radial head, uh, I guess in terms of rehab considerations, if I do a radial head uh, open reduction internal fixation, I may be a little more cautious because I don't, depending on the stability of the fixation, but if it's an arthroplasty, I want to get more aggressive with the elbow motion and forearm rotation. Uh, probably more importantly, though, is the LUCL. Uh, with this repair, I really tell patients and therapists that I don't want them to abduct their shoulder because that puts such a varus load on the elbow and that can cause attenuation or even laxity or rupture of the LUCL and also to avoid maximal supination because that causes the radial head to roll out, as Dr. Cassie described in the PLRI or the posterior lateral rot rotatory instability but I want them to move in flexion extension pretty quickly. And that last component is that coronoid fracture. Now, not every coronoid fracture needs to be fixed. And I'm talking about the small avulsion fractures. Um, if, it's, if I feel like there's still instability at the ulnar humeral joint, uh, and there's too small of a piece for any type of meaningful fixation, I'll just grab that anterior capsule and do this capsule adhesis. Whereas if it's large enough, then I can put a little buttress plate on there. That then goes to how aggressive I want patients to move in terminal extension. If I do an anterior capsule adhesis, I may want to limit that because uh, I don't want to tear out. Um, and also, uh, depending on how big or fragile that fragment is, I may not, I may really want to shut down any type of rotational torque uh, imparted on the onohumeral joint and the greater uh, sigmoid notch. So I think abiding by that uh, and being aggressive, I think this is a pretty good outcome for um, a patient that had this uh, uh, t t terrible, terrible, terrible triad uh, injury. Uh, and I can't stress enough how important uh, the communication is with the therapist. Now, what I worry about is in a patient like this who had quite a bit of a, another terrible triad, you can see I did the anterior capsule adhesis because I couldn't get them uh, couldn't, it wasn't size and sizable enough to fix. And then you can see uh, at two weeks, this patient is already unstable again. Uh, and so I had to revise this patient. So I think um, uh, definitely important to uh, have some, I think your rehab, post-op rehab um, is about 90% of the success of the surgery. Thanks. So we get this patient from Dr. Ree. Um, we have the luxury of when we're working with our surgeons that they are across the hall or just one page away, which is great. Um, when we're looking, getting kind of the post-op images, looking at any x-rays if they're available, looking at rigidity of bony fixation, what was used, certainly looking at the ligament stability and the ligaments that were repaired. So if you just have the lateral collateral ligament repaired, you are gonna position that patient in pronation. If both the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament were repaired, then typically we'd go in neutral, but talking to the surgeon about that, trying to figure out ideal positioning and really being mindful about forearm rotation. Um, seeing this patient, so I have another picture here. This is a kind of a different type of static splint that we have. Um, it's a delta cast. But when we're progressing range of motion, again, getting the patient in a position that's comfortable. So oftentimes to start that supine, able to kind of isolate the forearm in a pronated, or pronated position and kind of work on some flexion and extension. I think one big thing Dr. Rhea talked about is avoiding that shoulder abduction as well as internal and external rotation. And a big piece of my patient education initially, especially to optimize comfort, is even thinking about sleeping. So often, um, you know, trying to avoid kind of internal rotation, maybe propping with some pillows, but also when we're thinking about edema management, not necessarily having them put their arm up with pillows or on the back of the couch, you know, finding that balance between appropriately elevating but not putting any stress on those ligamentous structures. Progressing to um, kind of as the sutures or staples are removed, thinking about that soft tissue, trying to be even a little bit more aggressive, monitoring that, making sure that you know, everything is healing correctly, but again, trying to push that range of motion, working towards getting that flexion back, especially for function, it's gonna be more important than the extension. And then looking at, again, communicating with the surgeon if needed, looking at a static orthosis to kind of progress extension if needed, looking about three weeks um, 
And then I think an important thing too with this type of injury is trying to strengthen the dynamic elbow stabilizers, looking at supporting the arm on a tabletop and working the wrist flexion and extension, kind of working that strengthening, making sure we're getting some stability um, just to aid to the stability of the elbow itself. And um, often with any sort of traumatic elbow injury, thinking about any sort of soft tissue tightness, the biceps, triceps, any pain around the scar. Um, I included a picture. Sometimes we'll use some instruments to assist working on that soft tissue because it can be just another limiting factor to achieving the optimal range of motion. Um, some considerations, again, thinking about the pain, um, optimizing that patient's comfort, progressing through that range of motion, um, careful measurements, looking at heterotrophic ossification, especially with this type of injury with so many structures involved, um, and then being mindful of functional, functional tasks. Are there any questions? That was great. Uh, you brought up a, a really important point. Um, space is a commodity in a lot of uh, hand therapy offices and not uh, all of them have uh, exam tables. So mm -hmm. um, what do you do? So I know Alex steals one of our, one of our exam rooms once in a while. Um, do you have any advice for the therapists who don't have uh, a table? Um, I think so if you're looking at um, you know, having the patient recline down, even like a fainting chair, you know, just getting them reclined, getting that arm supported a little bit. Um, if you're working on like the dynamic stabilizers or some wrist motion supporting the forearm on the, like on a patient's thigh, sometimes that can be a little bit more comfortable as well. Um, even like having them stand, um, support their upper back against the wall to do some range of motion can be other, other options that I would look into, but Alex might know of some more too. Thanks. Ceiling tables would be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, so our clinic room is a bit of a glorified closet. Um, so uh, oftentimes, yeah, I am uh, st either stealing a clinic room from one of the doctors or using um, one of the beds in the cast room. <laughs> um, there have been occasions where uh, just for some reason, like those rooms weren't accessible. And um, what I will do is either I will get a table that you can adjust the height, um, or we have like big, like fat textbooks that I'll layer with towels just to get them um, to where that arm is supported on the table um, and then stretch them from there. So it's not ideal, but um, there are ways to, to finagle it, so. I just need to make it clear that uh, hand therapy does not fall under hand surgery or orthopedic surgery in my department. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I've been trying to advocate for at least a window in her office. Yeah, I, I'd love okay. to see some sun, but. <laughs> I think you're up next, aren't you? Yes. Um, to your reconstruction. Yes. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right, so the dreaded stiff elbow. Um, so first I just wanna put in a plug for this article by Davila and Johnston Jones. This is from the Journal of Hand Therapy. Um, I think especially if you're not as familiar as uh, rehabbing a stiff elbow, this is just a really nice resource. Um, I have all of my clinical students read this. Um, so I want to just briefly talk about non-operative rehab. Um, so really with all of our therapeutic interventions for this, we're really focusing on improving uh, tissue instability, tissue uh, extensibility, excuse me, um, in order to restore range of motion. Uh, so um, even just when these patients walk into the door and we start them on heat, um, I wanna be thinking about stretch. Um, so uh, I like to often combine uh, heating them with uh, low load stretch uh, in the direction that we're focusing on, um, which is typically uh, extension. Um, so here is a picture um, right here of 
uh, how I would uh, support, make sure I'm supporting the upper arm and shoulder, um, adding a weight just to kind of produce a nice uh, stretch. You can also stretch them into flexion. You just want to be mindful when you're doing this that you're not provoking any ulnar nerve symptoms. You just want to make sure that you're checking in with these patients uh, while they're heating up. Um, and then just kind of touching on uh, some of the things I like to do. Um, I think joint mobilization can be really great to help improve uh, capsular mobility, um, especially if they're just really not moving. Um, as far as the literature goes, um, there's pretty moderate research uh, for joint mobilization with other joints, uh, not a whole lot of research done on elbows, um, but something that I found particularly helpful. Um, and then with uh, range of motion, again, just to emphasize Keeley's point, it really is uh, most beneficial if you can lay these patients in supine. It's going to stabilize that shoulder um, and prevent so shoulder substitution. Um, and really just from the therapist point, um, just give you a much better, e easier way to be able to manipulate their arm. Uh, another thing that I really like to do is uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation uh, or PNF stretching, as it's called, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and essentially, uh, there's different variations of it, um, but it's utilizing uh, reflexes and reciprocal inhibition. And so it's intermittent contractions uh, followed by passive stretching. Uh, to decrease uh, protective guarding around the stiff joints. So um, particularly if the patient has a lot of um, co-contractions or muscle guarding, this can just be a nice thing to add to, uh, to when you're working on passive range of motion. Um, and then pretty much always gonna have some sort of corrective splinting with these patients um, just to continue to work on stretch even when they're outside of the clinic. Um, I'm going to go into more of a detailed discussion with these uh, when talking about post-operative rehab. Um, I will say that I tend to have a preference for uh, static splinting at night and static progressive splinting during the daytime. Um, with strengthening, again, we just want to make sure that we're uh, addressing adjacent uh, joints and musculature that uh, contribute to um, uh, stabilizing the elbow, and then of course, uh, want to use teach back method to optimize carryover of any education. Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and then let Dr. Cassie discuss uh, his arthroscopic case. That was great. Uh, one of the best quotes I heard about advice uh, to patients was from uh, Bob Hotchkiss, and that was, uh, don't work on real estate you already own. Love that quote. Uh, but when to operate, who knows? Uh, we say when progress plateaus or at least six months post-op because uh, the healing from trauma goes through stages and you don't wanna intervene unnecessarily while it's still in an inflammatory phase because uh, it could uh, compromise the outcome. Uh, level five evidence for me, uh, compliance with uh, OT embracing is a good predictor of success with surgery. If patients are just not compliant with the therapy uh, from the outset, they're not gonna be uh, great candidates for, uh, for surgery. Open versus arthroscopic, uh, the published literature uh, uh, suggests that the uh, results are uh, about equivalent, I would say, probably a little better flexion with at least uh, releasing the posterior band of the MCL, which most people do open. Uh, and I tend to do combined, uh, sometimes uh, arthroscopic and open. So uh, anatomy of a contracture. So in this, the x-ray, the, uh, the problem is obvious. It's in the back with the uh, osteophytes posteriorly. But the problem that's not obvious is the capsular contracture, which always accompanies the, the problem in the back. So you have to address both the bony problem and the capsular problem to achieve correction. Uh, and it's important to get good x-rays and sometimes a CT scan. And here's one, the patient had limited extension and it turns out there was a screw in her uh, olecranon fossa, as you see here. And obviously that elbow is not gonna straighten out all the way without removing the screw. Uh, this is a professional boxer. 
uh, who uh, had trouble defending himself because anytime he tried to block a punch, his coronoid osteophyte would hit his uh, coronoid fossa and it would hurt. Uh, and so this is pre-op and post-op. And you can see uh, we tend to overdo it a little bit because we know this is arthritis and it's going to come back. And so we, we want to give it, uh, we don't want to give it a head start at recurring. So you can see what was an Audi is now an Innie and the coronoid tip is now uh, gone to uh, create mo uh, more room and he went back to professional boxing. Again, don't forget the posterior MCL. It's tight and greater than 80 degrees of flexion. So if a patient can't flex past 80 or 80 degrees preoperatively, you really need to uh, think about at least releasing the, that uh, posterior band of the MCL and uh, probably release the ulnar nerve at the same time. The ulnar nerve is right there on top of that uh, band head needs to be protected. Who are not good candidates for uh, an arthroscopic alone procedure? Can, uh, patients such as this with uh, osteophytes around the periphery of the trochlea, uh, electronon, huge electronon osteophytes. Uh, I would recommend not tackling those uh, arthroscopically alone. So here's a patient uh, with a pretty good flexion, just limited extension. That's pre-op and then intra-op after the release. Uh, you can see got good extension. So we'll go through this. Uh, so uh, I, I do these procedures in the lateral decubitus position that you see here. So all of the images are with the hand to the floor and the humerus to the ceiling. Uh, so uh, it's helpful to have a, a number of uh, portals. So you may see patients with uh, multiple incisions and sometimes we'll uh, put a retractor in, uh, which may be uh, just a blunt uh, piece of metal that will just hold the space open. So when we uh, use the suction on the shaver, it doesn't collapse. So here, uh, the humerus is up. So we're above the coronoid and that's a burr, taking out the osteophytes above the coronoid fossa to allow for some more space. And that's that rod that I mentioned. See, so you can see that's holding the capsule open. The anterior capsular release. Um, these are intra-articular adhesions, as you see here. So if, we, if you talk about arthrofibrosis or intra-articular adhesions, this is what they look like. Um, so the next step for me is often if the space is really tight is to peel the capsule off the anterior uh, distal humerus like that to open up the space. And then we actually divide the capsule and it does reform. Uh, and so we open up the capsule like that. That's a type of scissor that we use arthroscopically. And then sometimes we'll take some of the capsule away so that there's not a head start for that capsule to, uh, to grow back. Normally it's really thin and you can see here it's pretty thick. Uh, debriding the coronoid, so that's the coronoid with a burr, and uh, you can use the burr to, de uh, to debride the, that osteophyte there, like that, or you can use an osteotome, which is a little more risky, uh, but you can take it off in one piece and you're not creating a lot of bone debris doing it that way. Um, the fossa can get obliterated as well, and so you need to make space for the coronoid, and this is a curette cleaning out that space uh, to find the native bone, uh, and that's a burr used to uh, make that a uh, little bit of an innie, like I mentioned. Olecranon osteophytes, uh, we have to be very careful about trimming these because it, the tip of the olecranon is very close to the articular surface and it's also very close to the ulnar nerve. And that's the same burr looking in the back. Um, if the uh, osteophytes are uh, like this one on the left-hand image, that's right next to the ulnar nerve. And it, there is no harm in making a little incision through the triceps and uh, knocking that off. Uh, much safer than trying to do it arthroscopically. And if there's a lot of stuff like that image that I showed earlier in the back, uh, like you can see the loose body in the upper left, uh, the crap in the fossa, uh, much easier and really a little morbidity of opening it in the back. And it also saves a lot of time. And that's all of that stuff that we get out in the back. And if I had done that arthroscopically, it would have taken me 45 minutes and I wouldn't have done as good a job. Um, I just want to conclude with one, this may seem counterintuitive, but uh, she had an open distal humerus fracture, a brachial artery uh, injury, and she required a free flap and she needed this mascalase, so a staged reconstruction. And she had a very stiff elbow, so 60 to 105, that's her, and you can see her flap. Uh, and I had no idea where to make an incision if I were to do it open. Uh, and so we did it arthroscopically, and uh, this is what we got, it was, uh, it was, it was awesome. So uh, arthroscopic, I think uh, anecdotally that the recovery short term is, is definitely quicker than doing it open. Uh, but there are indications to do it open and Jeff's gonna talk about that um, next. Jeff. Thanks, Chuck. Those are great cases and um, 
the uh, you know he showed you a, a number of five to eight second clips, but those surgeries are an hour and a half to two hours at least. Um, so you know that's a lot of a lot of effort that he just showed uh, boiled down and distilled very quickly. So um, we're going to talk about the stiff elbow, um, looking at open um, capsulectomy. So again. Um, we use our elbows for different things nowadays, uh, but, it, but it's really important elbow motion to the entire upper extremity. Um, and estimates have shown that the elbow motion is about 70% uh, of the entire upper extremity with flexion extension, as John said, uh, being relatively more important uh, percentage-wise than forearm rotation. Um, this is the last Detroit Tiger that did anything. Unfortunately, now he's with the Houston Astros, um, but uh, so be it. So th this number gets quoted a lot uh, in terms of what's normal and what's functional, but realize that someone can have a pretty significant decrease amount of motion, but not uh, have a lot of impairment. So um, I think Chuck mentioned in the beginning about um, uh, managing a patient's expectations. Uh, it's very important because what might seem like a big difference side to side isn't a huge functional impairment. And the same with forearm rotation. Um, that a big uh, decrease uh, doesn't actually lead to that much impairment. So here's a 29-year-old woman, uh, assembly line worker who injured her right arm at work, uh, now has uh, fairly limited motion with significant loss of flexion uh, and ulnar nerve symptoms. And despite all the non-operative management that you've heard about, no improvement with uh, conventional therapy, some static progressive splinting, uh, so now we're going to operate, and then the question is, do we go medial or lateral, uh, and sort of along the lines of what Chuck was saying with the uh, delayed ulnar nerve, um, we go medial, and this is a, a shot, so the, the shoulder is to the right, the hand is to the left, here you see the ulnar nerve, uh, and here's that thick capsule, so this is what Chuck was cutting arthroscopically, um, we're going to excise it um, with a big scissors, uh, again, ulnar nerve back here. And then when we're done, all that capsule is gone uh, because as Chuck says, it does reform and tries to defeat our best efforts. So um, we, we get her moving fully in the operating room, uh, but more importantly, uh, you can see here she is at eight or 10 weeks um, and she's smiling uh, and is happy with her results and no more ulnar nerve symptoms. Uh, here's another patient, middle-aged uh, fellow who had a uh, radial head fracture uh, and was doing well, but uh, as Chuck said, sort of started uh, started doing well and then and then uh, did worse and worse and worse, uh, developed, as you can see, this heterotopic ossification. Um, as you can see here, he's limited in flexion and limited in pronation, and you can see his HO. Um, so in this case, we want lateral um, resection of the anterior capsule and uh, heterotopic bone, uh, importantly, preserving the lateral ulnar collateral uh, ligament and then resecting posterior capsule. Uh, and then here you see after uh, resection uh, of capsule, resection of heterotopic bone, uh, and in this case, a radial head resection uh, and good restoration of, of motion. So uh, that gets to the point of um, the concern for HO and um, as, oops, as uh, was mentioned, uh, prophylaxis or anticipating it is more important than reacting to it once it's occurred. So this is a guy that you know right off the bat you're going to prophylax him. Um, my go-to is, uh, is a delayed uh, or a sustained release anti-inflammatory called Indocin. Uh, if someone has GI issues and can't take it, um, we've shown that uh, radiation, prophylactic radiation is successful. So uh, I put in a number of uh, references uh, for you all to read. And thanks, Chuck. I did want to respond. You you posed a question, and and it's sort of the uh, the ultimate nightmare of what do you do when someone after you do a complex elbow surgery is going to a therapist that you're not familiar with. Um, and again, we like to have them go to our own uh, therapist that we're familiar with. We don't all have that luxury. Um, and one of the things I do to try to um, set the patient's expectations is I'll actually tell the patient I'm going to be the bad guy. I'm going to push your elbow to the degree that I'm comfortable having it pushed. And I want them to get a mental image of what that feels like so that they can tell that therapist who, you know, may want to be a nice person, but isn't pushing them hard enough. And as you said, is too cautious. Um, and that way the patient sort of has a mental picture of, of what their therapy should feel like. So thanks. Can you can just comment on that? On why, why not radiation? Why, why, why not radiation? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, 
lost you a little bit. So I, my go-to is um, is Indocin, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory. If the person um, has an issue with it, if they have ulcers or gastritis or something like that, um, no qualms about using radiation. I think, I think it's funny because you wrote a paper or a lot of that paper demonstrating that there's lots of radiation, but you're not using it routinely. Dr. Cassidy, something's hey, wrong with your, your um, audio. So I think, Chuck, I think the question is, if we, we wrote a paper showing good results with it, why don't we use it routinely, I, is what I was sort of getting from that. Um, okay. And again, um, I, I think just because from a patient standpoint, it's sort of scary and intimidating. And, you know, they're recently post-op and you're packaging them up and sending them to, you know, a different part of the hospital to get radiation therapy. And, you know, the radiation therapists talk with them about a 1% per year sarcoma transformation and things like that. So um, e even though I'm, I'm okay using it in terms of concerns for wound healing and things like that, um, just to not expose patients to that. Um, and if you can take three weeks worth of an insulin, I think that's a pretty modest intervention. Chuck, I think uh, we need to, maybe, yeah. maybe uh, I'll, I'll answer a question later. While Chuck is adjusting, I want to log off and log back on, or um, I, I don't with your audio. There we go. While Chuck right. is well, anyway, I'll stop sharing. And Jeff, can we ask a question of Peter? Peter, yes, I am here. You know, um, I saw that you were talking about terrible triad, and I noticed that when you rehab them, uh, your patient didn't have full extension, and that is. That fits into what the data suggests, that they have anywhere from 11 to 20 degrees of fle fixed flexion contracture. How much do you and your therapist perseverate over that? Or do you have a comfort zone about how much flexion contracture you're willing to accept? Um, I, I guess I don't, uh, that's a good question. I, I guess I don't uh, have a, a number that uh, I would want for them to have full arc of motion. Um, the, uh, it's, just a, it's just that fine line of, having uh, so many sh critical structures injured that you want them to stay stable, but still aggressive as possible. And I realize that if they do have, you know, 10, 20, 30 degrees of flexion contracture and deficit in terminal extension, you know, there's plenty of evidence that shows that ecstatic progressive uh, uh, splinting can get, um, get uh, you know, quite a few 20, 30, even 40 degrees of arc of motion. And so I'd rather keep them at the early phase. I think that was a thir three month post-op that um, if they're stable and, and that's the point that they're at, then I just, at that point, tell our therapist just to get after it, utilize static progressive bracing, employ the patients into their own recovery. And if, uh, you know, despite doing all that, they're still have a functional deficit, then I feel like at that point in that e with or without any HO, I feel like I could do a um, osteocapsular release um, if necessary. But honestly, I I've never had to do that with all the terrible triads that I've, I've had to fix. I like to get aggressive, but uh, rather keep them stay stable too. Thank you. I think Chuck's audio is fixed. Chuck's all yours. Oh, thanks. thanks, Shai. I, I think, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, it sounds answered. great. Awesome. No, that was great. Um, I think we're back to Alex. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go over uh, what rehab looks like post-release um, and then hoping to uh, get a little more into a discussion about orthotic intervention. Um, so uh, after uh, these contracture releases, our goal for therapy is to reach and maintain the range of motion attained by the surgeon in the OR. Um, it's very unlikely that we're going to gain beyond that. Um, and if you do, then you're a miracle therapist and I'm gonna send all my patients to you. Um, and then as far as post-op rehab for the patient um, who's undergone an arthroscopic release for some open release, it's not gonna vary greatly. Um, however, depending on the surgeon, uh, there may be uh, varying initiations of therapy. Um, 
And again, before these surgeon or before these patients even undergo surgery, really important to make sure that these patients are going to be compliant uh, with their post-op therapy. Um, adherence to therapy is such a strong predictor of outcomes with these procedures. Um, so make sure that that's established before they uh, go under the knife. Um, and so just considerations, um, things that I like to know is what was the etiology of the contracture, what was causing the limitation, um, what was their pre-op status as far as their range of motion goes. Um, obviously want to know what the type of release was, um, need to protect certain structures, typically not. Um, and then what's the status of the ulnar nerve? Um, were they symptomatic prior? Um, was there any manipulation of the nerve during surgery? Um, and are they symptomatic now? Um, and then again, important that we know what the interop range of motion was as well as what the surgeon's expected outcomes are. So we know what kind of know what we're working towards. Um, again, want to consider uh, different patient factors. Um, and then again, setting realistic uh, goals with these patients, but also ones that are client-centered. So I'm typically going to see these patients uh, within the first 24 hours um, after their surgery, uh, typically post-op day one. Uh, sometimes I'll see, just given the setup of uh, our hospital, um, if they are admitted overnight for um, prophylactic radiation, I may see them uh, in while well, they're still admitted and inpatient. Um, and I'm going to fabricate an anterior uh, thermoplast orthosis in max elbow extension that they're going to wear at nighttime. Um, so, uh, and just something I'd like to point out, I, a little trick of mine, I like to add this hole uh, right above the elbow crease uh, and then bring the strap in. Uh, I think it just gives a nice mechanical advantage and that way the patient can actually pull their elbow up into the splint to get a nice stretch. Um, this early on, of course, we want to address edema and pain. Um, and then we just, we really want to get these patients moving. Um, they are not going to have any range of motion restrictions typically. So, um, so straight out of the bat, um, we're, we're going. Um, and with that in mind, we do still want to respect pain um, and be mindful not to uh, cause any kind of inflammatory response at this point. Um, but we still do want to be pretty intensive with, uh, with getting them moving. Um. Um, and so then I'm typically going to see these patients for two to three times a week for the first six weeks. Uh, and then um, if they're doing pretty well, decrease that frequency to one time a week and follow them for about 12 weeks. Um, and the uh, rehab is going to look fairly similar to uh, non-op. Um, just other things we might consider is uh, particularly for the uh, open release that we're managing the scar, preventing any adhesions, um, neuromobilization, particularly if the, they're symptomatic in the ulnar nerve. Um, and then around four to six weeks, um, if they're progressing well and their range of motion is improving, uh, work into uh, progressive resistive strengthening. Um, and then if uh, we're working on flexion, uh, we may need to add a flexion orthosis at this point. Typically, I stick with uh, working on flexion during the daytime. Um, I do not like the idea of uh, splinting someone at nighttime in flexion. I think you're just asking for uh, an angry ulnar nerve. Um, and then again, seeing these patients for about 12 weeks, um, but if uh, particularly with static progressive splinting, I may have them continue to wear the splint up to six to 12 months, uh, as there is literature that you can still continue to make gains beyond uh, that time frame. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, my slides. Um, and then these are just. Uh, some uh, stretches or exercises I might do with these patients. I really like uh, to give them exercises that they can replicate at home uh, with 
uh, everyday items that they might have. Um, so just for time's sake, I won't go over those. Um, and then just complications. So uh, just important as a therapist to be mindful that because we are getting these patients so quickly after uh, surgery that we are often the uh, first to see these, uh, any of these kind of complications. Um, and so we just want to make sure that uh, we're communicating these findings uh, to the surgeon. All right, so now I'm going to try and be brief, but just kind of going through um, some different types of orthoses. Um, they have such a strong presence with this procedure. Um, for static, uh, as I showed earlier, this is going to be most effective when the flexion contracture is less than 30 degrees. Um, beyond that, it just doesn't have a great mechanical advantage um, and is typically going to be worn at nighttime. Um, and then if we're, uh, they're having some issues with uh, getting more motion, uh, we may look at either a commercial or a custom uh, static progressive. Uh, how that works is that the uh, patient's going to position the elbow at their end range um, while producing to the point of a stretch uh, and hold it in a fixed position. And then as the force or the stretch dissipates, um, they're then going to reposition it uh, into a further amount of stretch. Um, one thing I like about uh, static progressive is, um, especially with the commercial ones, is you can use the same orthosis to work on both flexion extension. Um, one downside uh, is that, uh, as particularly with this one, this is a jazz splinter joint active system, uh, is that once you get to a certain degree of flexion, it's not really going to help you with in-range flexion. Uh, so you may have to consider uh, something uh, like this, which is made in the orthotics and prosthetics department um, at our hospital. So, um, and there's also dynamic, uh, which is exerting a constant force via an elastic or spring mechanism. Um, I find that it's often less tolerated than static progressive. So I typically uh, don't use these. Um, and then continuous passive motion, um, I've never used in my life. Um, I don't think patients tolerate them well, and I think there's a risk for neurologic injury or wound dissonance. Um, so which is best? We don't know. Um, most of the research compares static progressive to dynamic, um, and a lot of it just says that uh, there's no significant difference and uh, it's really based on patient preference. Um, as far as optimal wear time, that is also unknown. Uh, it's important that we're considering the individual patient's tolerance, what are logistical concerns as far as how long they can wear it, um, and further research is definitely warranted. So I will leave that. Well, thanks. It sounds like Pete, Pete and I are disciples of uh, the Mayo Way and uh, my uh, guru is uh, Dr. Mori, uh, who advised his patients to wear braces 23 hours a day. He'd ask them what they wanted more, extension or flexion. And if they said extension, they'd wear the brace in extension. So John also, right? Where they wear the brace in extension for eight hours, then they'd wear a flexion brace for eight hours and then wear extension brace for seven hours. And then they could take it all off to take a shower and move their arm a little bit and then put it back on. Um, and I am a believer, uh, but I don't have uh, any idea of how compliant my patients are or how compliant Dr. Mori's were. Yeah, I think it's great if they don't have much of a life outside of therapy. <laughs> um, but I, I think there is, uh, obviously there's, you know, gonna be different factors uh, for each individual as to how often is realistic for them, so. Okay. Can, yeah, can I think I ask, we have only time for one more talk, but John, and, and I would want to ask Chai since he was co-author of that paper. John. Yeah. Oh, no, just real quick. What, what's the, you know, the panel and the therapist think about, you know, uh, post-operative splinting and extension, you know, and it depends. If people lack extension, I tend to do it. I just think the patients hate walking out of the hospital with their arms straight and it's hard for them to get the flexion back. So, you know, it depends on the case, but what does everybody think? John, uh, I think that um, 
if if that is their main uh, goal is to get terminal extension, then uh, then I will just like uh, Chuck said, I will preferentially put them into more extension and during their rehab and their static uh, splinting phase. But, but I also think that the, as I mentioned earlier, the elbow, uh, the maximum capacity is at 80, right? The elbow is going to fill up with fluid. And if you leave it in a semi-flex position, it's going to be harder to get either direction. Uh, and so that's why in general, it depends, but in general, I'd like to splint them an extension and then have them come back. They actually leave that splint on till they see the therapist. The therapist takes that splint off, doesn't move the elbow, makes that thermoplast splint before they start the therapy. And then chat. Yes, sir. Just uh, dynamic, static, or none. So um, long and short answer is, this is based on bias. I know I was a co-author on that paper. We found no significant difference in when we compared jazz to Dynasplint. I just find patients seem to, in their, in their head, they seem to understand jazz better. So maybe that's my bias. But the turnbuckle concept appeals to patients much easier. So. OK, yeah. I think the, the Dynasplint's easier to apply. <laughs> but the jazz is easier to use, I think. Yeah. But all right, why don't we finish out with, uh, this has been a great session and the time is flying by, uh, Pete and uh, Keely. Pete. All right, uh, let me share my screen once again. Uh, we're just gonna shift uh, a little bit to the um, medial collateral ligament or anterior band reconstruction. Uh, here's the case as a, as a patient, he's a ski instructor who fell on his non-dominant arm. Uh, a little bit uh, a while ago, um, no reported elbow dislocation, but he has the sense of instability in his elbow, and he has this positive valgus, uh, moving valgus stress test that was described by one of my partners, Dr. Uh, Sean O'Driscoll. And I put this in here mainly not not because uh, you have to do this exam, but you know most people that don't have an anterior band of the MCL don't don't necessarily need surgery, but in patients that do this often, like throwers, then um, and it's painful or there's uh, instability, then um, it's a good uh, option for reconstruction. So in this patient here, here is MR cuts uh, T1 and T2, and you can see that <clears throat> there is uh, the loss of the entire uh, anterior band and MCL off of the sublime tubercle. So just reiterate that this is a primary stabilizer, so it, um, it will cause some instability, either subjective or objective. There's a lot of ways to reconstruct this, and I think probably the most popular way is this docking uh, technique, which I'll describe here. Uh, proximal here is to the left of my screen, at least, and then uh, distal to the right. Um, this is uh, similar to your inside to ulnar nerve decompression. Here is the medial epicondyle, if you can see my cursor. Um, and then once you move a lot, uh, the mobilize and protect the ulnar nerve, you can do your arthrotomy here. This is the only humeral, um, sorry, the um, distal humerus medial of condyle that the uh, ligament has been ruptured and here exposing the sublime tubercle right here. Uh, I think everyone differs, I think, on how they actually dock this allograft or autograft tendon into the sublime tubercle of the uh, proximal ulna. I just use these, um, this device to create a bone tunnel uh, through which then I can shuttle my graft and then that then comes back up to the origin of the anterior band, the MCL, uh, just at the anterior inferior portion of the medial epicondyle. Um, and this docking technique really is to create this uh, bone tunnel to deliver uh, these two strands of your, of your graft through. Uh, this is just uh, an illustration of trying to get the isom isometric point in both flexion and extension so you get, you get this reconstructed correctly. Uh, and then you pull, oh, I'll go back here. You pull that through and everyone differs on how they secure this uh, dock, if you will. I just pull these suture tails out through bone tunnels and tie over a bone bridge, which uh, is, is pretty stable, but certainly not as stable as a um, interference screw. And then here's management of the ulnar nerve with a anterior subcutaneous transposition. Um, from my perspective, uh, I want them to move as quickly as possible uh, in flexion and extension. I don't want to impart any type of valgus stress, um, but also I want to encourage ulnar nerve gliding because I did uh, transpose the ulnar nerve in a subcutaneous position. Uh, 
I really think that the, the, your surgeon's comfort and how aggressive you are with range of motion is again, dependent upon how comfortable and confident they are with their docking. If they use the uh, docking technique here. And I just put just some examples of how people do that. Interference screws are very strong. I still feel pretty comfortable with my docking technique with the pull through over the bone tunnel. And I think using that and uh, having a great partnership with your uh, therapist, and certainly here, I'm very blessed with that. Um, you know, I, this patient uh, actually two, uh, two weeks after his surgery said he's go he was going to Europe for the ski season. He swore he wasn't going to uh, uh, ski, but he came back afterwards. And I think he did a pretty good job even doing therapy on his own with a home program. Stop sharing here. All right, so when we are getting these patients, um, I just want to circle back. I know Dr. Lawton had mentioned um, having patients, um, having the surgeon push on the patients and getting that elbow range of motion, but I think I'd add one point to it as a therapist that seeing a patient maybe without the op report or not really knowing, maybe just have the patients get a picture on their phone to show the therapist. I think that would be a really quick and easy way to give us a good picture of of where to push it. Um, but going back to the ulnar collateral ligament repair, kind of, again, thinking about the typical evaluation, um, being mindful of range of motion, especially at the forearm. You can see here, this is another type of orthoses. This one is hinged, so you can actually set it in specific degrees of motion. Being mindful, um, typically, again, communicating with the surgeon, but limiting kind of mid arc flexion extension um, with that forearm supinated and um, kind of initiating that range of motion once things are, are a little bit more stable. Um, this is just a couple pictures. So one thing I like to add as far as getting some dynamic rotation is using, this is just like a water bottle with, it's actually a coffee cup with some coffee in it, working on that um, rotation, but with a little bit of that dynamic force, that proprioceptive input. And that's something that can simply be recreated at home with like a cup of water or a water bottle. Um, you can even have the, the patient hold a pencil, just something really light as they're working on that range of motion just for some of that, that visual feedback. Um, and like Dr. Re was saying, avoiding any valgus stress. So I think, again, patient education is really important. Um, avoiding that motion, even if it's something as simple as rolling over in bed and pulling bed sheets, you know, avoiding any of that pull at, um, at the medial collateral ligament. Um, and then two, just to give them some long-term support, looking at different types of like neoprene elbow supports, especially if they're getting back to higher level activities and kind of gradually increasing isometrics, kind of working on some of that stability before you start doing any kind of dynamic strengthening as far as TheraBand or with free weights. So I kind of went through that quickly. I think we're a little short on time, but if there's any questions. That was great. I have a question for both of you, um, just in terms of expectations for return to work for a laborer. So that sounded like that guy was maybe a laborer. So uh, when does that guy get back to work? Well, I like to crack the whip pretty early, Chuck, and so I kick him out. To, okay. um, well, I think it just depends on uh, definitely pre-op uh, consideration of what their expectations are. And if they have a, a job that um, allows them to wear their orthosis in uh, the position that typically in that situation, I'd put them in elbow uh, flexion and uh, neutral uh, forearm rotation. Um, if they can accommodate that, then I get them back to most clerical or supervisory jobs right away. Um, I, I wouldn't, sh I, I don't let them go back to anything else um, that uh, would allow them to come out of their orthosis at least uh, up until six weeks uh, post-operatively at that point. Um, if they are fairly compliant and, um, and uh, then I, I may let them do a little bit more. Uh, Keely, if they're a laborer uh, in terms of strengthening, getting them back, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, respecting the timeline that Dr. Ree puts out, but I also think like working on grip strengthening, um, working on safe wrist strengthening with that elbow supported, and also working on like upper back and rotator cuff strengthening, doing that safely, maybe starting with some isometrics, um, kind of working on some isolated scapulothoracic strengthening too, especially when they're returning back to that high demand task. You don't want the shoulder capsule getting tight at all, because that's just going to limit them as they're, especially if they're getting back to a higher demand.
cast. You don't want any of the biomechanics to be off once the elbow is kind of in working order. Great, thanks. I'd like the, all the speakers to pop back on the screen and to, to, to thank you all. Uh, Keely and Jeff and Alex, Pete, Becky as always, John, and uh, for Chai and Becky for coming up with a concept. What a, what a great concept and a great uh, six weeks so far. Thank you. And thanks to the uh, participants for joining us and staying loyal to, uh, to our program over the last uh, month and a half. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Dr. Cassidy, and to our really esteemed colleagues and panel, we just can't thank you enough for your time, your participation, your energy, your engagement. Um, I know I, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of our participants, but based on the questions and responses we're getting, we're, I think people are just really grateful that, for the opportunity to have this education. So, um, Dr. Mudgall, do you want to add anything before I wrap us up? No, I'm just smiling because I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. Nice work, everyone, and thank you. Well done. This is really fantastic. So just so you know, as we move out of our session tonight, um, you can access the recording. It will be sent to you um, through Zoom 24 hours after the conclusion of this webinar. But also if you check out the AO North America um, YouTube page, you can find all the talks from this and many other great sessions that have happened over the past 18 months. So please check out the YouTube channel and share it. I'm really excited to announce or to just remind everybody about our last session. So our final session in this series is an international roundtable. We have guests from Sudan, South Africa, Malawi, Guatemala, um, Argentina, Colombia. And so we have many wonderful guests that are coming to bring us great cases and really to help us think about hand therapy and hand surgery in resource um, strapped or research um, poor, resource poor, excuse me, areas of our world. And we are really excited about the learning that will take place for us from them. And I just think the, in, the international exchange that will happen will be very exciting. And we really hope that you will join us next Thursday for our final session. So with that, um, our whole Hand Therapy Essentials team thanks you very much for being here tonight. And um, Mackenzie, if you would go ahead and pull up our poll, we will wrap it up for the evening. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Mm -hmm.